Jose Protagio Risal Mercado Alonso Real on the June 19, 1861 to December 30, 1896, was a Filipino nationalist and polymath during the tail end of the Spanish colonial period of the Philippines. He is considered the national hero, Pambunsang Bayani, of the Philippines. An ophthalmologist by profession, Rizal became a writer and a key member of the Filipino propaganda movement, which advocated political reforms for the colony under Spain. He was executed by the Spanish colonial government for the crime of rebellion after the Philippine Revolution, inspired in part by his writings, broke out. Though he was not actively involved in its planning or conduct, he ultimately approved of its goals which eventually led to Philippine independence. He is widely considered one of the greatest heroes of the Philippines and has been recommended to be so honored by an officially empaneled National Heroes Committee. However, no law, executive order or proclamation has been enacted or issued officially proclaiming any Filipino historical figure as a national hero. He was the author of the novels Nalimi Tangeri and El Filibusterismo, and a number of poems and essays. Early Life Jose Rizal's Baptismal Register Francisco Rizal Mercado, 1818-1898 Jose Rizal was born in 1861 to Francisco Rizal Mercado y Alejandro and Teodora Alonso Rialanda y Quintas in the town of Calamba in Laguna Province. He had nine sisters and one brother. His parents were leaseholders of a hacienda and an accompanying rice farm by the Dominicans. Both their families had adopted the additional surnames of Rizal and Rialanda in 1849, after Governor General Narciso Claveria y Zaldua decreed the adoption of Spanish surnames among the Filipinos for census purposes, though they already had Spanish names. Like many families in the Philippines, the Rizals were of mixed mestizo origin. Jose's patrilineal lineage could be traced back to Fujian in China through his father's ancestor Lamco, a hockey and Chinese merchant who immigrated to the Philippines in the late 17th century. Lamco traveled to Manila from Xiamen, China, possibly to avoid the famine or plague in his home district, and more probably to escape the Manchu invasion during the transition from Ming to Qing. He finally decided to stay in the islands as a farmer. In 1697, to escape the bitter anti-Chinese prejudice that existed in the Philippines, he converted to Catholicism, changed his name to Domingo Mercado and married the daughter of Chinese friend Augustin Chinko. On his mother's side, Rizal's ancestry included Chinese, Japanese and Tagalog blood. His mother's lineage can be traced to the affluent Florentina family of Chinese mestizo families originating in Bailey Uig, Bulacan. He also had Spanish ancestry. Regina Ochoa, a grandmother of his mother, Teodora, had mixed Spanish, Chinese, and Tagalog blood. His grandfather was a half-Spaniard engineer named Lorenzo Alberto Alonso. From an early age, Jose showed a precocious intellect. He learned the alphabet from his mother at three, and could read and write at age five. Upon enrolling at the Ateneo Municipal de Manila, he dropped the last three names that made up his full name, on the advice of his brother, Paisano, and the Mercado family, thus rendering his name as Jose Protagio Rizal. Of this, he later wrote, My family never paid much attention to our second surname Rizal, but now I had to use it, thus giving me the appearance of an illegitimate child. This was to enable him to travel freely and disassociate him from his brother, who had gained notoriety with his earlier links to Filipino priests Mariano Gomez, Jose Burgos, and Jacinto Zamora, popularly known as Gomberza, who had been accused and executed for treason. Education Rizal first studied under Justiniano Aquino Cruz in Binan, Laguna, before he was sent to Manila. As to his father's request, he took the entrance examination in Colegio de San Juan de Letran but he then enrolled at the Ateneo Municipal de Manila and graduated as one of the nine students in his class declared sober salient or outstanding. He continued his education at the Ateneo Municipal de Manila to obtain a land surveyor and assessor's degree, and at the same time at the University of Santo Tomas where he did take up a preparatory course in law and finished with a mark of excel and or excellent. He finished the course of philosophy as a pre-law. 
Upon learning that his mother was going blind, he decided to switch to medicine at the medical school of Santo Tomas specializing later in ophthalmology. He received his four-year practical training in medicine at Hospital de San Juan de Dios in Intramuros. In his last year at medical school, he received a mark of sober salient in courses of Pathologia Medica, Medical Pathology, Pathologia Chirurgica, Surgical Pathology, and Obstetrics. Rizal, known for being an intelligent student, had some difficulty in some subjects in medical school such as Physica, Physics, and Pathologia General, General Pathology. One of the causes is due to the evident discrimination of the professor to Filipino students. Without his parents' knowledge and consent, but secretly supported by his brother Pachano, he traveled alone to Madrid in May 1882 and studied medicine at the Universidad Central de Madrid where he earned the degree, Licentiate in Medicine. He also attended medical lectures at the University of Paris and the University of Heidelberg. In Berlin, he was inducted as a member of the Berlin Ethnological Society and the Berlin Anthropological Society under the patronage of the famous pathologist Rudolf Birkhoff. Following custom, he delivered an address in German in April 1887 before the Anthropological Society on the orthography and structure of the Tagalog language. He left Heidelberg a poem, A Las Flores del Heidelberg which was both an evocation and a prayer for the welfare of his native land and the unification of common values between East and West. At Heidelberg, the 25-year-old Rizal completed in 1887 his eye specialization under the renowned professor, Otto Becker. There he used the newly invented ophthalmoscope, invented by Hermann von Helmholtz, to later operate on his own mother's eye. From Heidelberg, Rizal wrote his parents, I spend half of the day in the study of German and the other half, in the diseases of the eye. Twice a week, I go to the beer brewery, or beer hall, to speak German with my student friends. He lived in a Karlstrasse boarding house then moved to Ludwigsplatz. There, he met Reverend Karl Ulmer and stayed with them in Wilhelmsfeld, where he wrote the last few chapters of Nalimi Tangeri. Rizal was a polymath, skilled in both science and the arts. He painted, sketched, and made sculptures and wood carving. He was a prolific poet, essayist, and novelist whose most famous works were his two novels, Nalimi Tangeri and its sequel, El Filibusterismo. These social commentaries during the Spanish colonization of the country formed the nucleus of literature that inspired peaceful reformists and armed revolutionaries alike. Rizal was also a polyglot, conversant in 22 languages. Rizal's multifacetedness was described by his German friend, Dr. Adolf Bernhard Meyer, as stupendous. Documented studies show him to be a polymath with the ability to master various skills and subjects. He was an ophthalmologist, sculptor, painter, educator, farmer, historian, playwright, and journalist. Besides poetry and creative writing, he dabbled, with varying degrees of expertise, in architecture, cartography, economics, ethnology, anthropology, sociology, dramatics, martial arts, fencing, and pistol shooting. He was also a Freemason, joining Acacia Lodge No. 9 during his time in Spain and becoming a Master Mason in 1884. Personal Life, Relationships, and Ventures Redneck Sila Terrace, where Rizal lived during his self-imposed exile in Hong Kong, photo taken in 2011. Jose Rizal's life is one of the most documented of 19th century Filipinos due to the vast and extensive records written by and about him. 26 Almost everything in his short life is recorded somewhere, being himself a regular diarist and prolific letter writer, much of the material having survived. His biographers, however, have faced difficulty in translating his writings because of Rizal's habit of switching from one language to another. They drew largely from his travel diaries with their insights of a young Asian encountering the West for the first time. They included his later trips, home and back again to Europe through Japan and the United States and, finally, through his self-imposed exile in Hong Kong. Shortly after he graduated from the Ateneo Municipal de Manila, now Ateneo de Manila University, Rizal, who was then 16 years old, and a friend, Mariano K. Tigback, K. 
came to visit Rizal's maternal grandmother in Tonda, Manila. Mariano brought along his sister, Segunda K. Tigback, a 14-year-old Batangana from Lipa, Batangas. It was the first time they met and Rizal described Segunda as rather short, with eyes that were eloquent and ardent at times and languid at others, rosy, cheeked, with an enchanting and provocative smile that revealed very beautiful teeth, and the ear of a SYLPH, her entire self diffused a mysterious charm. His grandmother's guests were mostly college students and they knew that Rizal had skills in painting. They suggested that Rizal should make a portrait of Segunda. He complied reluctantly and made a pencil sketch of her. Unfortunately for Rizal who had referred to her as his first love in his memoir Memorias de un estudiante de Manila, K. Tyke Back was already engaged to Manuel Luce. From December 1891 to June 1892, Rizal lived with his family in No. 2 of Rednak Sila Terrace Mid-Levels, Hong Kong Island. Rizal used 5 de Aguilar Street, Central District, Hong Kong Island, as his ophthalmology clinic from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. This period of his life included his recorded affections of which nine were identified. They were Gertrude Beckett of Calcott Crescent, Primrose Hill, Camden, London, wealthy and high-minded Nellie Bustet of the English and Iberian merchant family, last descendant of a noble Japanese family Seiko Yuzui, affectionately called Osei San, his earlier friendship with Segunda K. Tigback, Leonor Valenzuela, an eight-year romantic relationship with a distant cousin, Leonor Rivera, popularly thought to be the inspiration for the character of Maria Clara in Nalimi Tangeri. From December 1891 to June 1892, Rizal lived with his family in No. 2 of Rednak Sila Terrace Mid-Levels, Hong Kong Island. Rizal used 5 de Aguilar Street, Central District, Hong Kong Island, as his ophthalmology clinic from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. This period of his life included his recorded affections of which nine were identified. They were Gertrude Beckett of Calcott Crescent, Primrose Hill, Camden, London, wealthy and high-minded Nellie Bustet of the English and Iberian merchant family, last descendant of a noble Japanese family Seiko Yuzui, affectionately called Osei San, his earlier friendship with Segunda K. Tigback, Leonor Valenzuela, an eight-year romantic relationship with a distant cousin, Leonor Rivera, popularly thought to be the inspiration for the character of Maria Clara in Nalimi Tangeri. Relationship with Josephine Bracken Further information, Josephine Bracken. In February 1895, Rizal, 33, met Josephine Bracken, an Irish woman from Hong Kong, when she accompanied her blind adoptive father, George Toffer, to have his eyes checked by Rizal. 34 After frequent visits, Rizal and Bracken fell in love with each other. They applied to marry but, because of Rizal's reputation from his writings and political stance, the local priest Father Obak would only hold the ceremony if Rizal could get permission from the Bishop of Cebu. He was unable to obtain an ecclesiastical marriage because he would not return to Catholicism. After accompanying her father to Manila on her return to Hong Kong, and before heading back to Dapitan to live with Rizal, Josephine introduced herself to members of Rizal's family in Manila. His mother suggested a civil marriage, which she believed to be a lesser sacrament but less sinful to Rizal's conscience than making any sort of political retraction in order to gain permission from the bishop. Rizal and Josephine lived as husband and wife in a common-law marriage in Talisi in Dapitan. The couple had a son who lived only for a few hours, Rizal named him after his father Francisco. In Brussels and Spain, 1890-1892. In 1890, Rizal, 29, left Paris for Brussels as he was preparing for the publication of his annotations of Antonio de Morgas Sutsasis de las Islas Filipinas, 1609. He lived in the boarding house of the two Jacobi sisters, Katharina and Susanna, who had a niece Susanna, Thill, age 16. Historian Gregorio F. Zaid states that Rizal had his romance with Suzanne Jacobi, 45, the petite niece of his landladies. Belgian prose slash Wilders, however, believed that Rizal had a romance with the 17-year-old niece, Susanna Thill, 
as his other liaisons were all with young women. He found records clarifying their names and ages. Rizal's Brussels stay was short-lived, he moved to Madrid, giving the young Susanna a box of chocolates. She wrote to him in French, after your departure, I did not take the chocolate. The box is still intact as on the day of your parting. Don't delay too long writing us because I wear out the solace of my shoes for running to the mailbox to see if there is a letter from you. There will never be any home in which you are so loved as in that in Brussels, so, you little bad boy, hurry up and come back, 37. In 2007, Slash Mwilder's group arranged for an historical marker honoring Rizal to be placed at the house. He published Dimanche de Ramio, Palm Sunday, a socio-political essay, in Berlin on November 30, 1886. He discussed the significance of Palm Sunday in socio-political terms, this entry of Jesus into Jerusalem decided the fate of the jealous priests, the Pharisees, of all those who believed themselves the only ones who had the right to speak in the name of God, of those who would not admit the truth said by others because they have not been said by them. That triumph, those hosannas, all those flowers, those olive branches, were not for Jesus alone, they were the songs of the victory of the new law, they were the canticles celebrating the dignification of man, the liberty of man, the first mortal blow directed against despotism and slavery. Shortly its publication, Rizal was summoned by the German police who suspected him of being a French spy. The content of Rizal's writings changed considerably in his two most famous novels, Nali Me Tangeri, published in Berlin in 1887, and El Filibusterismo, published in Ghent in 1891. For the latter, he used funds borrowed from his friends. These writings angered both the Spanish colonial elite and many educated Filipinos due to their symbolism. They are critical of Spanish friars and the power of the church. Rizal's friend Ferdinand Blumentritt, an Austria-Hungary-born professor and historian, wrote that the novel's characters were drawn from real life and that every episode can be repeated on any day in the Philippines. Blumentritt was the grandson of the imperial treasurer at Vienna in the former Austro-Hungarian Empire and a staunch defender of the Catholic faith. This did not dissuade him from writing the preface of El Filibusterismo after he had translated Nalimi Tangeri into German. As Blumentritt had warned, these books resulted in Rizal's being prosecuted as the inciter of revolution. He was eventually tried by the military, convicted and executed. Teaching the natives where they stood brought about an adverse reaction, as the Philippine Revolution of 1896 took off virulently thereafter. As leader of the reform movement of Filipino students in Spain, Rizal contributed essays, allegories, poems, and editorials to the Spanish newspaper La Solidaridad in Barcelona, in this case Rizal used a pen name, Dimas Olung, Longlon and Maype Gaza. The core of his writing centers on liberal and progressive ideas of individual rights and freedom, specifically, rights for the Filipino people. He shared the same sentiments with members of the movement, that the Philippines is battling, in Rizal's own words, a double-faced Goliath corrupt friars and bad government. His commentaries reiterate the following agenda note 8. That the Philippines be made a province of Spain, the Philippines was a province of New Spain, now Mexico, administered from Mexico City from 1565 to 1821. From 1821 to 1898 it was administered directly from Spain. Representation in the Cortes Filipino priests instead of Spanish friars, Augustinians, Dominicans, and Franciscans, in parishes and remote sitios. Freedom of assembly and speech. Equal rights before the law, for both Filipino and Spanish plaintiffs. The colonial authorities in the Philippines did not favor these reforms. Such Spanish intellectuals as Moreda, Anamano, Pi y Margal, and others did endorse them. In 1890, a rivalry developed between Rizal and Marcelo H. del Pilar for the leadership of La Solidaridad and the reform movement in Europe. Majority of the expatriates supported the leadership of del Pilar. When Ceslao Ritana, a political commentator in Spain, had slighted Rizal by writing an insulting article in La Epoca, a newspaper in Madrid. 
he implied that the family and friends of Rizal were evicted from their lands in Kalamba for not having paid their due rents. The incident, when Rizal was 10, stemmed from an accusation that Rizal's mother, Teodora, tried to poison the wife of a cousin, but she said she was trying to help. With the approval of the church prelates, and without a hearing, she was ordered to prison in Santa Cruz in 1871. She was made to walk the 10 miles, 16 kilometers, from Kalamba. She was released after two and a half years of appeals to the highest court. In 1887, Rizal wrote a petition on behalf of the tenants of Kalamba, and later that year led them to speak out against the friars' attempts to raise rent. They initiated a litigation which resulted in the Dominicans evicting them from their homes, including the Rizal family. General Valeriano Whaler had the buildings on the farm torn down. Upon reading the article, Rizal sent a representative to challenge Ritana to a duel. Ritana published a public apology and later became one of Rizal's biggest admirers, writing Rizal's most important biography, Vida y Escritos del José Rizal. Return to Philippines, 1892-1896 Exile in Dapitan Bust of Padre Guarico in Clay, by Rizal Rizal's pencil sketch of Bloom and Tritt. Upon his return to Manila in 1892, he formed a civic movement called La Liga Filipina. The League advocated these moderate social reforms through legal means, but was disbanded by the governor. At that time, he had already been declared an enemy of the state by the Spanish authorities because of the publication of his novel. Rizal was implicated in the activities of the nascent rebellion and in July 1892, was deported to Dapitan in the province of Samboanga, a peninsula of Mindanao. 43 there he built a school, a hospital, and a water supply system, and taught and engaged in farming and horticulture. Abaca, then the vital raw material for cordage and which Rizal and his students planted in the thousands, was a memorial. Citation needed. The boys' school, which taught in Spanish, and included English as a foreign language, considered a prescient if unusual option then, was conceived by Rizal and antedated Gordonstown with its aims of inculcating resourcefulness and self-sufficiency in young men. They would later enjoy successful lives as farmers and honest government officials. Point one, a Muslim, became a Dadu, and another, Jose Seniero, who was with Rizal throughout the life of the school, became governor of Samboanga. In Dapitan, the Jesuits mounted a great effort to secure his return to the fold led by Fray Francisco de Paula Sanchez, his former professor, who failed in his mission. The task was resumed by Fray Pastels, a prominent member of the order. In a letter to Pastels, Rizal sails close to the deism familiar to us today. We are entirely in accord in admitting the existence of God. How can I doubt his when I am convinced of mine? Who so recognizes the effect recognizes the cause. To doubt God is to doubt one's own conscience, and in consequence, it would be to doubt everything, and then what is life for? Now then, my faith in God, if the result of a ratiocination may be called faith, is blind, blind in the sense of knowing nothing. I neither believe nor disbelieve the qualities which many attribute to him, before theologians and philosophers definitions and lucubrations of this ineffable and inscrutable being I find myself smiling. Faced with the conviction of seeing myself confronting the supreme problem, which confused voices seek to explain to me, I cannot but reply, it could be, but the God that I foreknow is far more grand, far more good, plus supra, I believe in, revelation, but not in revelation or revelations which each religion or religions claim to possess. Examining them impartially, comparing them and scrutinizing them, one cannot avoid discerning the human fingernail and the stamp of the time in which they were written. No, let us not make God in our image, poor inhabitants that we are of a distant planet lost in infinite space. However, brilliant and sublime our intelligence may be, it is scarcely more than a small spark which shines and in an instant is extinguished, and it alone can give us no idea of that blaze that conflagration, that ocean of light. I believe in revelation, but in that living revelation which surrounds us on every side, in that voice, mighty, 
eternal, unceasing, incorruptible, clear, distinct, universal as is the being from whom it proceeds, in that revelation which speaks to us and penetrates us from the moment we are born until we die. What books can better reveal to us the goodness of God, His love, His providence, His eternity, His glory, His wisdom? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. His best friend, Professor Ferdinand Blumentritt, kept him in touch with European friends and fellow scientists who wrote a stream of letters which arrived in Dutch, French, German, and English and which baffled the censors, delaying their transmittal. Those four years of his exile coincided with the development of the Philippine Revolution from inception and to its final breakout, which, from the viewpoint of the court which was to try him, suggested his complicity in it. He condemned the uprising, although all the members of the Katipunan had made him their honorary president and had used his name as a cry for war, unity, and liberty. He is known to making the resolution of bearing personal sacrifice instead of the incoming revolution, believing that a peaceful stand is the best way to avoid further suffering in the country and loss of Filipino lives. In Rizal's own words, I consider myself happy for being able to suffer a little for a cause which I believe to be sacred. I believe further that in any undertaking, the more one suffers for it, the surer its success. If this be fanaticism may God pardon me, but my poor judgment does not see it as such. In Dapitan, Rizal wrote Heck S. Sibylla Cumana, a parlor game for his students, with questions and answers for which a wooden top was used. In 2004, Jean Paul Verstraeten traced this book and the wooden top, as well as Rizal's personal watch, spoon, and psalter. Arrest and Trial By 1896, the rebellion fomented by the Katipunan, a militant secret society, had become a full-blown revolution, proving to be a nationwide uprising. 57 Self-Published Source Rizal had earlier volunteered his services as a doctor in Cuba and was given leave by Governor General Ramon Blanco to serve in Cuba to minister to victims of yellow fever. Rizal and Josephine left Dapitan on August 1, 1896, with letter of recommendation from Blanco. Rizal was arrested en route to Cuba via Spain and was imprisoned in Barcelona on October 6, 1896. He was sent back the same day to Manila to stand trial as he was implicated in the revolution through his association with members of the Katipunan. During the entire passage, he was unchained, no Spaniard laid a hand on him, and had many opportunities to escape but refused to do so. While imprisoned in Fort Santiago, he issued a manifesto disavowing the current revolution in its present state and declaring that the education of Filipinos and their achievement of a national identity were prerequisites to freedom. Rizal was tried before a court-martial for rebellion, sedition, and conspiracy, and was convicted on all three charges and sentenced to death. Blanco, who was sympathetic to Rizal, had been forced out of office. The friars, led by then Archbishop of Manila Bernardino Nozolita had intercalated Camilo de Polavieja in his stead as the new Spanish Governor General of the Philippines after pressuring Queen Regent Maria Cristina of Spain, thus sealing Rizal's fate. Execution A photographic record of Rizal's execution in what was then Bagumbayan. Moments before his execution on December 30, 1896 by a squad of Filipino soldiers of the Spanish army, a backup force of regular Spanish army troops stood ready to shoot the executioners should they fail to obey orders. 58 The Spanish army surgeon general requested to take his pulse, it was normal. Aware of this the sergeant commanding the backup force hushed his men to silence when they began raising vivas with the highly partisan crowd of peninsular and mestizo Spaniards. His last words were those of Jesus Christ, consummatum est, it is finished. He was secretly buried in Paco Cemetery in Manila with no identification on his grave. His sister Narcissa toured all possible grave sites and found freshly turned earth at the cemetery with guards posted at the gate. Assuming this could be the most likely spot, there never having been any ground burials, she made a gift to the caretaker to mark the site RPJ, Rizal's initials in reverse. His undated poem Mi Ultimo Adios, believed to have been written a few days before his execution, 
was hidden in an alcohol stove, which was later handed to his family with his few remaining possessions, including the final letters and his last bequests. During their visit, Rizal reminded his sisters in English, there is something inside it, referring to the alcohol stove given by the Pardo de Tavares which was to be returned after his execution, thereby emphasizing the importance of the poem. This instruction was followed by another, look in my shoes, in which another item was secreted. Exhumation of his remains in August 1898, under American rule, revealed that he had been uncoffined, his burial was not on sanctified ground granted to the confessed faithful, and whatever was in his shoes had disintegrated. He is now buried in the Rizal Monument in Manila. In his letter to his family he wrote, Treat our aged parents as you would wish to be treated, love them greatly in memory of me, December 30, 1896. 26. He gave his family instructions for his burial, bury me in the ground. Place a stone and a cross over it. My name, the date of my birth and of my death. Nothing more. If later you wish to surround my grave with a fence, you can do it. No anniversaries. In his final letter, to Blumentritt, tomorrow at 7, I shall be shot, but I am innocent of the crime of rebellion. I am going to die with a tranquil conscience. 26 Rizal is believed to be the first Filipino revolutionary whose death is attributed entirely to his work as a writer, and through dissent and civil disobedience enabled him to successfully destroy Spain's moral primacy to rule. He also bequeathed a book personally bound by him in Dapitan to his best and dearest friend. When Blumentritt received it in his hometown of Litimeris, Leitmeritz, he broke down and wept. Rizal's execution, as well as those of other political dissidents, mostly anarchist, in Barcelona was ultimately invoked by Michel Angiolillo, an Italian anarchist, when he assassinated Spanish Prime Minister Antonio Canovas del Castillo. Works and Writings Rizal wrote mostly in Spanish, the lingua franca of the Spanish East Indies, though some of his letters, for example S.A.M.G.A. Kababahang Tagamalilos, were written in Tagalog. His works have since been translated into a number of languages including Tagalog and English. Novels and Essays El Amor Patrio, 1882 Essay Toast to Juan Luna and Felix Hidalgo, 1884 speech given at Restaurante Inglés, Madrid. Nalimi Tangeri, 1887 novel, literally Latin for Touch Me Not, from John 2017. Alan Manglahi, What Are the Race, a condiment attributed to Dr. Jose Rizal. S.A.M.G.A. Kababahang Tagamalilos, To the Young Women of Malilos, 1889 Letter. Annotations to Antonio de Morgas Sutsesis de las Islas Filipinas, 1889. Filipinas dentro de Cien Anos, The Philippines a Century Hence, 1889 90 Essay. So Brilla Indolencia de los Filipinos, The Indolence of Filipinos, 1890 Essay. Como es y gobiernan las Filipinas, Governing the Philippine Islands, 1890 essay. El filibusterismo, 1891 novel, sequel to Nali Mi Tangeri. Una visita del Senora Filipinas, also known as Friars and Filipinos, 14 page unfinished novel written in 1889. Memorias de un Gallo, 2 page unfinished satire. Makamisa, unfinished Tagalog language novel written in 1892. The Triumph of Science Over Death, by Rizal. Poetry. Felicitation, 1874-75. El Embark 68, The Embarkation, 1875. Por la Education Recibe Luster La Patria, 1876. Un Recuerdo a Mi Pueblo, 1876. Al Nino Jesus, C. 1876. A La Juventud Filipina, To the Philippine Youth, 1879. Mi Piden Versos. 
1882. Canto de Maria Clara, from Nalimi Tangeri, 1887. Hymno al Trabajo, de la S.A. Pagua, 1888. Kundaman, disputed, 1889, also attributed to Pedro Paterno. Ami Musa, to my muse, 1890. El Canto del Viajero, 1892-96. Mi Retiro, 1895. Mi Ultimo Adios, 1896. Mi Primera Inspiration, disputed, also attributed to Antonio Lopez, Rizal's nephew. Plays. El Concho de los Dioses, The Council of Gods. Junto al Pasig, Along the Pasig. San Eustaquio, Martyr, Saint Eustache, The Martyr. Other works. Rizal also tried his hand at painting and sculpture. His most famous sculptural work was The Triumph of Science Over Death, a clay sculpture of a naked young woman with overflowing hair, standing on a skull while bearing a torch held high. The woman symbolized the ignorance of humankind during the Dark Ages, while the torch she bore symbolized the enlightenment science brings over the whole world. He sent the sculpture as a gift to his dear friend Ferdinand Blumentritt, together with another one named The Triumph of Death Over Life. The woman is shown trampling the skull, a symbol of death, to signify the victory the humankind achieved by conquering the bane of death through their scientific advancements. The original sculpture is now displayed at the Rizal Shrine Museum at Fort Santiago in Intramuros, Manila. A large replica, made of concrete, stands in front of Fernando Calderon Hall, the building which houses the College of Medicine of the University of the Philippines Manila along Pedro Gil Street in Ermita, Manila. Rizal is also noted to be a carver and sculptor who made works from clay, plaster of Paris and baticuling wood, the last being his preferred medium. While in exile in Dapitan, he served as a mentor to three peat natives including Jose Concan, who in turn taught three generations of carvers back in his hometown. Rizal is known to have made 56 sculptural works, but only 18 of these are known to be still existing as of 2021. Reactions after death Several historians report that Rizal retracted his anti-Catholic ideas through a document which stated, I retract with all my heart whatever in my words, writings, publications, and conduct have been contrary to my character as a son of the Catholic Church. However, there are doubts of its authenticity given that there is no certificate clarification needed of Rizal's Catholic marriage to Josephine Bracken. Also there is an allegation that the retraction document was a forgery. After analyzing six major documents of Rizal, Ricardo Pasqual concluded that the retraction document, said to have been discovered in 1935, was not in Rizal's handwriting. Senator Rafael Palma, a former president of the University of the Philippines and a prominent Mason, argued that a retraction is not in keeping with Rizal's character and mature beliefs. He called the retraction story a pious fraud. Others who deny the retraction are Frank Laubach a Protestant minister, Austin Coates, a British writer, and Ricardo Manapat, director of the National Archives. Those who affirm the authenticity of Rizal's retraction are prominent Philippine historians such as Nick Joaquin Nicolas Zafra of Up Leon Maria Guerrero III Gregorio Zaid Guillermo Gomez Rivera, Ambeth Ocampo John Schumacher A.D. Antonio Molina Paul Dumal and Austin Craig they take the retraction document as authentic, having been judged as such by a foremost expert on the writings of Rizal, Teodoro Calla, a 33rd degree mason, and handwriting experts, known and recognized. In our courts of justice, H. Otley Bayer and Dr. Jose Idel Rosario, both of up. Historians also refer to 11 eyewitnesses when Rizal wrote his retraction, signed a Catholic prayer book, and recited Catholic prayers, and the multitude who saw him kiss the crucifix before his execution. A great-grand-nephew of Rizal, Father Marciano Guzman, cites that Rizal's four confessions were certified by five eyewitnesses, ten qualified witnesses, seven newspapers, and twelve historians and writers including Aglipayan bishops, 
Masons and anti-clericals. One witness was the head of the Spanish Supreme Court at the time of his notarized declaration and was highly esteemed by Rizal for his integrity. Because of what he sees as the strength these direct evidence have in the light of the historical method, in contrast with merely circumstantial evidence, a professor emeritus of history Nicholas Zafra called the retraction a plain unadorned fact of history. Guzman attributes the denial of retraction to the blatant disbelief and stubbornness of some Masons. To explain the retraction Guzman said that the factors are the long discussion and debate which appealed to reason and logic that he had with Friar Balaguer, the visits of his mentors and friends from the Ateneo, and the grace of God do the numerous prayers of religious communities. Supporters see in the retraction Rizal's moral courage, to recognize his mistakes, his reversion to the true faith, and thus his unfading glory, and a return to the ideals of his fathers which did not diminish his stature as a great patriot, on the contrary, it increased that stature to greatness. On the other hand, Senator Jose Diocno stated, surely whether Rizal died as a Catholic or an apostate adds or detracts nothing from his greatness as a Filipino. Catholic or Mason, Rizal is still Rizal, the hero who courted death to prove to those who deny our patriotism that we know how to die for our duty and our beliefs. Mi Ultimo Adios Main article, Mi Ultimo Adios The poem is more aptly titled Adios, Patria Adorata, literally Farewell, Beloved Fatherland, by virtue of logic and literary tradition, the words coming from the first line of the poem itself. It first appeared in print not in Manila but in Hong Kong in 1897, when a copy of the poem and an accompanying photograph came to J.P. Braga who decided to publish it in a monthly journal he edited. There was a delay when Braga, who greatly admired Rizal, wanted a good facsimile of the photograph and sent it to be engraved in London, a process taking well over two months. It finally appeared under Mi Ultimo Pensamiento, a title he supplied and by which it was known for a few years. Thus, the Jesuit Balaguer's anonymous account of the retraction and the marriage to Josephine was published in Barcelona before word of the poem's existence had reached him and he could revise what he had written. His account was too elaborate for Rizal to have had time to write audios. Six years after his death, when the Philippine Organic Act of 1902 was being debated in the United States Congress, Representative Henry Cooper of Wisconsin rendered an English translation of Rizal's valedictory poem capped by the peroration, Under what clime or what skies has tyranny claimed a nobler victim? Subsequently, the U.S. Congress passed the bill into law, which is now known as the Philippine Organic Act of 1902. This was a major breakthrough for a U.S. Congress that had yet to grant the equal rights to African Americans guaranteed to them in the U.S. Constitution and at a time the Chinese Exclusion Act was still in effect. It created the Philippine Legislature, appointed two Filipino delegates to the U.S. Congress, extended the U.S. Bill of Rights to Filipinos and laid the foundation for an autonomous government. The colony was on its way to independence. The United States passed the Jones Law that made the legislature fully autonomous until 1916 but did not recognize Philippine independence until the Treaty of Manila in 1946 50 years after Rizal's death. This same poem, which has inspired independence activists across the region and beyond, was recited, in its Indonesian translation by Rossi Han Anwar, by Indonesian soldiers of independence before going into battle. Later Life of Bracken Josephine Bracken, whom Rizal addressed as his wife on his last day promptly joined the revolutionary forces in Cavite province, making her way through thicket and mud across enemy lines, and helped reloading spent cartridges at the arsenal in Imus under the revolutionary general Pantaleon Garcia. Imus came under threat of recapture that the operation was moved, with Bracken, to Maragondon, the mountain redoubt in Cavite. She witnessed the Tijeros convention prior to returning to Manila and was summoned by the governor-general, but owing to her stepfather's American citizenship she could not be forcibly deported. She left voluntarily returning to Hong Kong. She later married another Filipino, Vicente Abad, a mestizo acting as agent for the tobacalera firm in the Philippines. She died of tuberculosis in Hong Kong on March 15, 1902 
and was buried at the Happy Valley Cemetery. She was immortalized by Rizal in the last stanza of Mi Ultimo Adios, Farewell, Sweet Stranger, My Friend, My Joy. Pola Vieja and Blanco Pola Vieja faced condemnation by his countrymen after his return to Spain. While visiting Girona, in Catalonia, circulars were distributed among the crowd bearing Rizal's last verses, his portrait, and the charge that Pola Vieja was responsible for the loss of the Philippines to Spain Ramon Blanco later presented his sash and sword to the Rizal family as an apology. Criticism and Controversies Attempts to debunk legends surrounding Rizal, and the tug of war between freethinker and Catholic, have kept his legacy controversial. The confusion over Rizal's real stance on the Philippine Revolution leads to the sometimes bitter question of his ranking as the nation's premier hero but then again, according to the National Historical Commission of the Philippines, NHCP, Section Chief Teodoro Atienza, and Filipino historian Ambeth Ocampo, there is no Filipino historical figure, including Rizal, that was officially declared as national hero through law or executive order. Although, there were laws and proclamations honoring Filipino heroes. Made national hero by colonial Americans. Some suggest that Jose Rizal was made a legislated national hero by the American forces occupying the Philippines. In 1901, the American Governor General William Howard Taft suggested that the U.S.-sponsored Philippine Commission name Rizal a national hero for Filipinos. Jose Rizal was an ideal candidate, favorable to the American occupiers since he was dead, and nonviolent, a favorable quality which, if emulated by Filipinos, would not threaten the American rule or change the status quo of the occupiers of the Philippine Islands. Rizal did not advocate independence for the Philippines either. Subsequently, the US sponsored commission passed Act No. 346, which set the anniversary of Rizal's death as a day of observance. Renato Constantino writes Rizal is a United States sponsored hero who was promoted as the greatest Filipino hero during the American colonial period of the Philippines, after Aguinaldo lost the Philippine American War. The United States promoted Rizal who represented peaceful political advocacy, in fact, repudiation of violent means in general, instead of more radical figures whose ideas could inspire resistance against American rule. Rizal was selected over Andres Bonifacio who was viewed too radical and Apolinario Mabini who was considered unregenerate. Made national hero by Emilio Aguinaldo. On the other hand, numerous sources 102 quote that it was General Emilio Aguinaldo, and not the second Philippine Commission, who first recognized December 30th as National Day of Mourning in memory of Rizal and other victims of Spanish tyranny. As per them, the first celebration of Rizal Day was held in Manila on December 30th, 1898, under the sponsorship of the Club Filipino. The veracity of both claims seems to be justified and hence difficult to ascertain. However, most historians agree that a majority of Filipinos were unaware of Rizal during his lifetime as he was a member of the richer elite classes, he was born in an affluent family, had lived abroad for nearly as long as he had lived in the Philippines, and wrote primarily in an elite language, at that time, Tagalog and Cebuano were the languages of the masses, about ideals as lofty as freedom, the masses were more concerned about day-to-day -day issues like earning money and making a living something which has not changed much today. Teodoro Agoncillo opines that the Philippine national hero, unlike those of other countries, is not the leader of its liberation forces. He gives the opinion that Andres Bonifacio not replace Rizal as national hero, like some have suggested, but that be honored alongside him. Constantino's analysis has been criticized for its polemicism and inaccuracies regarding Rizal. The historian Rafael Palmat, contends that the revolution of Bonifacio is a consequence wrought by the writings of Rizal and that although the Bonifacio's revolver produced an immediate outcome, the pen of Rizal generated a more lasting achievement. Critiques of books Others present him as a man of contradictions. Miguel de Unamuno in Rizal, the Tagalog Hamlet, said of him, a soul that dreads the revolution although deep down desires it. He pivots between fear and hope, between faith and despair. 
his critics assert this character flaw is translated into his two novels where he opposes violence in Nalimi Tangeri and appears to advocate it in Philly, contrasting Ibarra's idealism to Simon cynicism. His defenders insist this ambivalence is trounced when Simon is struck down in the sequel's final chapters, reaffirming the author's resolute stance, pure and spotless must the victim be if the sacrifice is to be acceptable. Many thinkers tend to find the characters of Maria Clara and Ibarra, Nalimi Tangeri, poor role models, Maria Clara being too frail, and young Ibarra being too accepting of circumstances, rather than being courageous and bold. In El Filibusterismo, Rizal had Father Florentino say, Our liberty will, not, be secured at the sword's point, we must secure it by making ourselves worthy of it. And when a people reaches that height God will provide a weapon, the idols will be shattered, tyranny will crumble like a house of cards and liberty will shine out like the first dawn. Rizal's attitude to the Philippine Revolution is also debated, not only based on his own writings, but also due to the varying eyewitness accounts of P.I.O. Valenzuela, a doctor who in 1895 had consulted Rizal in Dapitan on behalf of Bonifacio and the Catipunan. Role in the Philippine Revolution Upon the outbreak of the Philippine Revolution in 1896, Valenzuela surrendered to the Spanish authorities and testified in military court that Rizal had strongly condemned an armed struggle for independence when Valenzuela asked for his support. Rizal had even refused him entry to his house. Bonifacio, in turn, had openly denounced him as a coward for his refusal. However, years later, Valenzuela testified that Rizal had been favorable to an uprising as long as the Filipinos were well prepared, and well supplied with arms. Rizal had suggested that the Katipunan get wealthy and influential Filipino members of society on their side, or at least ensure they would stay neutral. Rizal had even suggested his friend Antonio Luna to lead the revolutionary forces since he had studied military science. Note 16 In the event that the Katipunan was discovered prematurely, they should fight rather than allow themselves to be killed. Valenzuela said to historian Teodoro Agoncillo that he had lied to the Spanish military authorities about Rizal's true stance toward a revolution in an attempt to exculpate him. Before his execution, Rizal wrote a proclamation denouncing the revolution. But as noted by historian Floro Quibayan, his final poem Mi Ultimo Adios contains a stanza which equates his coming execution and the rebels then dying in battle as fundamentally the same, as both are dying for their country. Legacy and Remembrance Rizal was a contemporary of Gandhi, Tagore, and Sun Yat-sen who also advocated liberty through peaceful means rather than by violent revolution. Coinciding with the appearance of those other leaders, Rizal from an early age had been enunciating in poems, tracts, and plays, ideas all his own of modern nationhood as a practical possibility in Asia. In Nalimi Tangeri, he stated that if European civilization had nothing better to offer, colonialism in Asia was doomed. Government poster from the 1950s. Though popularly mentioned, especially on blogs, there is no evidence to suggest that Gandhi or Nehru may have corresponded with Rizal, neither have they mentioned him in any of their memoirs or letters. But it was documented by Rizal's biographer, Austin Coates who interviewed Jawaharlal Nehru and Gandhi that Rizal was mentioned, specifically in Nehru's prison letters to his daughter Indira. As a political figure, Jose Rizal was the founder of La Liga Filipina, a civic organization that subsequently gave birth to the Katipunan led by Andres Bonifacio Note 18, a secret society which would start the Philippine Revolution against Spain that eventually laid the foundation of the First Philippine Republic under Emilio Aguinaldo. He was a proponent of achieving Philippine self-government peacefully through institutional reform rather than through violent revolution, and would only support violent means as a last resort. Rizal believed that the only justification for national liberation and self-government was the restoration of the dignity of the people saying why independence, if the slaves of today will be the tyrants of tomorrow. However, through careful examination of his works and statements, including Mi Ultimo Adios, Rizal reveals himself as a revolutionary. His image as the Tagalog Christ also intensified early reverence to him. Rizal, 
through his reading of Morga and other Western historians, knew of the genial image of Spain's early relations with his people. In his writings, he showed the disparity between the early colonialists and those of his day, with the latter's injustices giving rise to Gomberza and the Philippine Revolution of 1896. The English biographer, Austin Coates, and writer, Benedict Anderson, believe that Rizal gave the Philippine Revolution a genuinely national character, and that Rizal's patriotism and his standing as one of Asia's first intellectuals have inspired others of the importance of a national identity to nation-building. The Belgian researcher Jean-Paul J. P. Verstraeten authored several books about José Rizal, Rizal in Belgium and France, José Rizal's Europe, Growing Up Like Rizal, published by the National Historical Institute and in teachers programs all over the Philippines, reminiscences and travels of José Rizal and José Rizal Pearl of Unselfishness. He received an award from the President of the Philippines in recognition of his unwavering support and commitment to promote the health and education of disadvantaged Filipinos, and his invaluable contribution to engender the teachings and ideals of Dr. José Rizal in the Philippines and in Europe. One of the greatest researchers about Rizal nowadays is Lucien Spitiel. Several titles were bestowed on him, the first Filipino, greatest man of the brown race, among others. The Order of the Knights of Rizal, a civic and patriotic organization, boasts of dozens of chapters all over the globe. There are some remote area religious sects who venerate Rizal as a folk saint collectively known as the Rizalista religious movements, who claim him as a sublimation of Christ in September 1903, he was canonized as a saint in the Iglesia Filipina Independiente, however it was revoked in the 1950s. Species named after Rizal Jose Rizal was imprisoned at Fort Santiago and soon after he was banished at Dapitan where he plunged himself into studying of nature. He then able to collect a number of species of various classes, insects, butterflies, amphibians, reptiles, shells, snakes, and plants. Rizal sent many specimens of animals, insects, and plants for identification to the Anthropological and Ethnographical Museum of Dresden, Dresden Museum of Ethnology. It was not in his interest to receive any monetary payment, all he wanted were scientific books, magazines, and surgical instruments which he needed and used in Dapitan. During his exile, Rizal also secretly sent several specimens of flying dragons to Europe. He believed that they were a new species. The German zoologist Benno von Dalek named them Draco Rizali after Rizal. However, it has since been discovered that the species had already been described by the Belgian-British zoologist George Albert Bollinger in 1885 as Draco Gwynthry. There are three species named after Rizal. Draco Rizali, a small lizard, known as a flying dragon. Apogania Rizali, a very rare kind of beetle with five horns. Rakophorus Rizali, a peculiar frog species. Rakophorus Rizali. Historical commemoration. Although his field of action lay in politics, Rizal's real interests lay in the arts and sciences, in literature, and in his profession as an ophthalmologist. Shortly after his death, the Anthropological Society of Berlin met to honor him with a reading of a German translation of his farewell poem and Dr. Rudolf Verkov delivering the eulogy. The Rizal Monument now stands near the place where he fell at the Luneta in Bagumbayan, which is now called Rizal Park, a national park in Manila. The monument, which also contains his remains, was designed by the Swiss Richard Kisling of the William Tell sculpture in Altdorf, Uri. Note 21 The monument carries the inscription, I want to show to those who deprive people the right to love of country, that when we know how to sacrifice ourselves for our duties and convictions, death does not matter if one dies for those one loves, for his country and for others dear to him. The Taft Commission in June 1901 approved Act 137 renaming the district of Morong into the province of Rizal. Today, the wide acceptance of Rizal is evidenced by the countless towns, streets, and numerous parks in the Philippines named in his honor. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe.